as the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my heart, desire, and I long to worship you. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. You're my friend, and you are my brother, even though you are a king. I love you more than any other, so much more than anything. You strength my shield to you alone may my spirit yield you alone are my heart's desire and I long to worship you I want you more than gold or silver only you can satisfy you alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye you alone are my strength my shield to you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone. May my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. Yes. Good morning. <clears throat> Matthew 14, 22 through 34. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. And when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. And when they had crossed over, they came to the land of the Genesaret.
Thank you, Mike. Can you imagine? That must have been fun. Huh? Stepping out of that boat onto that water and walking on top of that water, that must have been fun when you stop and think about that. And then, of all things, for Peter to start having doubts after he's walking on the water, I think I'd have been dancing on the water. Wouldn't that have been fun, you know? I look at that and go, why, Peter? Why did you doubt? You know, you're walking on water. Why did you doubt? You know, if God has given him that ability to do that all of a sudden, you know, it just amazes me on it. Well, in the news, we got a few things. Of course, we know that who passed away this week? Queen of Elizabeth, yes. And it's amazing the fact that how many people in the United States follow her, you know, keep track of her. I mean, there's... A, one of the ladies at, at the bus company, and it's kind of, ma she, how do you want to say it? She reads on her daily, you know, everything that goes on in the queen's life, she would keep track of. You could ask her, well, what's going on today? And she would know on that. Now, so now I wonder if she's going to take and follow the prince, our King Charles now, I guess is what he's called, isn't it? But it's it. But what we need to keep track of is that King Charles is different than Queen Elizabeth. And he's already said that the tones in the kingdom are going to change. What is one of the things we know that King Charles was part of? <laughs> huh? The Great Reset. He was one of those people that went to the JFK school to learn all about the Great Reset. So let's keep an eye and see what happens over in England as as. Even though in his new position he's not supposed to be involved in politics, and we know that in his old position he was, so it'll be interesting to see how he handles this. New North Korea law allows for preemptive nuclear strikes. Country will automatically immediately fire nuke if Kim dies in attack. This is their new policy that they did the other day for fear of what the United States is going to do, you know. And they call this an irreversible policy. It says, as long as nuclear weapons exist on Earth, and imperialism and the anti-North Creek maneuvers of the U.S. and its followers remain, our road to strengthen a nuclear force will never end, Kim said. So here this relationship that we had just a couple years back, where his nuclear program had come to an end, now we're at the point again where we're seeing this being another concern that we have. Here's this one. Hillary rewriting history of her, of her email scandal. This one is just like you just can expect this is what's going to happen, don't you? You know? Instead of making the issue of what really happened, she now says it's okay to, if she does it, but nobody else can do it. Don't get that, you know. You got to blame Trump for what he's doing, but not her. Those are just a few of them. America's failed the election. Most key counties failed to keep records. Now we're finding out that 90% of the key counties across the nation failed to keep their 2020 election records, which by law they have to keep for 22 months. And we're finding out that a lot of them disband those, you know. It says 94 of the 100 counties did not keep records who voted in the 2020 election. Only two statewide election officers had the records preserved. Equally disturbing, even the six counties that did keep records, there was on average a 2.89% description between the number of people voting and the number of ballots cast. You know? As contentious as that last election was, you would have thought that they would have kept the records. And we find out more and more that is not the case. It's just going to lead to more concerns about this next election that's coming up, as everybody knows. Well, let's get into our lesson today. So let's open the word of prayer, shall we? Father, we do thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the fact that we can trust you. And even in our daily lives, Lord, we know that there are many times we 
We question the things that are going on, Lord, and it's just a matter of our faith and our maturity as to where we grow in you, Lord. So we just pray as we look into our lesson today that you help guide us and direct us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, do you remember the story of Elijah? Remember the story of Elijah? He is a great prophet, isn't he? The fact is, we hear about Elijah being one of those that we think is going to return in the end times. We hear of Elijah doing great, miraculous things. And yet, we come along to this story. Remember what Elijah had just did? He'd been, prior to this, he had told Ahab, Ahab being a bad king, he had told Ahab that there was going to be no rain until I say differently. You know, and God honored that request. And there was no rain. And Ahab, he sent out people looking for Elijah. Find this guy. Bring him back here. We need rain in the land. But it never happened. And then, all of a sudden, three years later, Elijah shows up. He says, I want you to go tell Ahab I'm here. And what does he do? Remember, he goes on Mount Carmel. He takes all the faults, priests, and prophets of that time. They bring him up to Mount Carmel. They have this little contest going on. If you can make fire come out of your altar, you're the God we worship, or we'll make fire come out of my God. Well, we know how the story goes. You know, they tried all day and all afternoon to try to get this fire to altar to catch on fire. Evening came, and what did Elijah do? He says, well, I want you to pour more water on it. I want you to soak it up good. Make sure it's good and wet. And then what did he do? He said, Lord, show them. And what happened? Yeah. It not only says it lapped up the water, it burnt the sacrifice, it burnt the rocks, it did everything, didn't it? God showed his example. And to the people, they were supposed to turn back to God, weren't they? But Ahab, he didn't particularly turn back to God. And then what did Elijah do? He says, Ahab, you better start getting on your chariot and getting out of here because it's going to start raining. And we know the story that it rained. And Elijah even beat him off the mountain. It was raining so bad on it. Remember that story? And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So let the God do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. In other words, Elijah, you just killed all of my prophets. I'm after you now. I'm going to kill you. And what does Elijah do? The man of God who had just experienced all of this stuff, what did Elijah do? Static's back again. Why don't, well, you got to tell me that, guys. All right, how's that? It says, And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. How can Elijah, the man of God, who's experienced all of this stuff that God has done, run for his life? Why would he do that? You know, of all people, you would think he would have trust God. But what does he do now? He doubts God on it. But it says, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came out and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die and said, it is enough now. Lord, take my life for I am no longer better than my father's. And you know what God did? He sent an angel down and fed him and watered him. And then he says, Elijah, run. Run. And for 40 days and 40 nights, 
Elijah ran away from Jezebel. Why would he do that when he's experienced God firsthand in his life? But he doubted. He doubted God and his ability to keep him alive during this time. 1 Kings 16 tells us how bad Ahab was. And it says, And Ahab made a wooden image. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. So, you know, Elijah knew how bad Ahab was. He also knew how bad Jezebel was. Remember the story of when Ahab wanted to take this garden from this guy, this vineyard from him, and make his own little private garden? And what did happen? The guy says, no, I'm not going to sell it to you. Jezebel says, go, go take a nap. When you get up, the problem will be solved. Sure enough, she made a, sent a letter to the city. The city made sure that he got killed. And no time at all, Jezebel tells Ahab, go get your garden. It's available for sale now. Isn't that amazing how that worked on it? So that happens. 1 Kings 17 tells us this. And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall be no dew nor rain these years except at my word. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Get away from here, turn eastward, and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. See, Elijah knew that God was going to take care of him. Ahab sent out people looking for Elijah. For three years, people were looking for Elijah. Where is he hidden at? And they could never find him. So Elijah knew that God was going to take care of him. But yet he doubted. Why would he doubt when he was so close to God? What is doubt? It's a feeling of uncertainty or conviction. How many of you experience doubt? Any of you? Of course we do. We all experience doubt. It's part of our life, isn't it? Well, Thomas. You remember Thomas? What was his known name as we always refer to him as? Doubting Thomas, Doubting Thomas right? Now Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his hands, the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now here he's got all of his friends testifying. We saw Jesus. He was here. He was among us. And yet Thomas would not believe. You know, why is that? He had to physically touch him, didn't he? He had to know that he was real. He doubted his friends. He didn't really believe that they were telling the truth. And yet every one of them swore this is really what happened. So how did Jesus solve that problem? Reappeared, didn't he? He said, touch me, Thomas. See, that I am real. Or how about this one? Remember John the Baptist? John the Baptist, who experienced Jesus firsthand, he comes out of the water. And what happens when he comes out of the water? The dove, as they say, the Holy Spirit ascended down upon him. And the Father spoke. Out of the heavens, you hear the Father speak and say, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. And you ask yourself, why would I doubt? But yet, John the Baptist doubted. He's sitting in prison. And what does he do? He asks some of his fellow followers. He says, go ask Jesus, are you really the one? What does Jesus do? He sends him back a message, doesn't he? He says, and he tells him, reassures him that he is the one. Why would John the Baptist doubt? But he did. 
Or how about this one, Abraham and Sarah? You remember that, that story? You know, the angel comes to Abraham and says, hey, you can have a child from Sarah. And what happens? They don't believe it. How can this old lady have a child? She's 90 plus years old. I'm 100. And as you read through this story, it says, And the Lord said to Abram, Why did Sarah laugh? Saying, Shall I surely bear a child since I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? See, Abraham and Sarah didn't believe that God, it was possible for God to do that. Is anything too hard for the Lord? This is what the angel said to them. And yet we all doubt that at times. We do think things are too hard for the Lord. We don't give him credit when he needs to have credit done to him. And yet, God showed Abraham and Sarah that they were going to have a child. He says, one year from now when I come back, you're going to have a child. It's going to be here. And yet they doubted. We see doubt throughout the Bible everywhere. It's part of our nature. We doubt. We ask the Lord for the prayers, and God says, I answer prayers, but yet we doubt. Is he really going to answer my prayer or not? It says here, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask a God who gives it all literally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. How many of us ask in faith and not doubt? Practically every one of us doubts at times on that. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive any from, from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. In other words, if you ask, God's going to answer. Now, what is the answer that God's going to give you? Yes, he might answer it immediately, or he may say, you have to wait a while. It's not in my timing. We've got to remember, it's God's timing we're applying, not our timing. But yet, we always ask, and we want instant results just like that. You know, Lord, take the pain away from me, just like that. Sometimes he does. Lord, heal me from alcoholism. Sometimes he does. Sometimes it takes time. But God answers prayers one way or another. He says, why do we doubt as Christians? And this is the answers that they came up with. One, we fail to see God at work. The reason why many people doubt is they don't realize God's working in their lives. Have you ever seen God answer your prayer? If you have, then it builds up your strength, doesn't it? It allows you to trust God one step closer. That doubt falls away. The other one says ignorance. We do not understand God's ways. We don't understand that God looks at our heart and he says, you're not ready for the answer. You know, but I'm taking care of you anyway. 1 Corinthians 16 says this. On that day, David first believed this psalm, in, delivered this psalm into the hand of Asaph and his brethren to thank the Lord. Who's Asaph? Asaph was one of the priests that David had assigned. And then he says this to Asaph. He says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. These are instructions he gives to Asaph. Sing to him, sing psalms to him, talk, to all, talk of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face evermore. Remember his marvelous works which he has done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. O seed of Israel, his servant, you children of Jacob, his chosen ones. So what instructions did he give Asaph to do? He says, help them to remember. 
remind them who God is. And yet later, we learn that even Asaph has doubt. And what do we see in Psalms? It's called the Psalm of Asaph, Psalm 73. And this is what Asaph says when he is talking. And he's the one who's supposed to be helping courage in the people. And he says this, he says, Truly God is good to Israel, to such are as pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My step had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked, for there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. He was envious of seeing what was happening to these wicked people that were being prosperous. And they were wealthy, and they were doing well. Things are going well for them. And he's going, why are they doing so well, and I'm not? Why, God, aren't you punishing them? What's wrong here? He says, they are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than heart could wish. And, and we look at people today and we ask the same exact question. God, why aren't you punishing them? It seems like they're just getting richer and richer and we're getting poorer and poorer. Why aren't you not punishing? They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens. And their tongues walks through the earth. Therefore, his people return here, and waters of a full cup are drained by them. In other words, here we come back, and the land is in trouble. you know. And they say, how does God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. If I had said I will speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. Until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood therein, he says. Surely. You set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they were brought to desolation as in a moment. They were utterly consumed with terrors. What is their outcome going to be? As a dream when one awakes, so Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved and I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by your right hand. You will guide me by your counsel and afterwards receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I deserve beside you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For indeed, those who are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all those who desert you for harlotry, but it is good for me to draw near to God. I will put my trust in the Lord that I may declare all your works. What did he finally come to the conclusion of? As prosperous as these people are, as much as they're doing to destroy the country, what was their outcome in the end? Punishment in hell, wasn't it? They were not going to get to see the glory that a that, um, I forgot his name right off the bat. Huh? Aza. Aza. Yep, I was going to have. So, I want to talk to the young people because there's something important here. It says, four reasons why young people doubt God. This is not only true for young people, it's true for older people too, isn't it? Number one, it says, lack of knowledge. It says, by not reading the Bible, you lack understanding of who God is. That is why we teach Bible stories. 
You say, why do I need to know that story of Ahab? Why do I need to know that story of Elijah or Elisha or all the others? Because they teach us who God is. And then number two is his lack of Bible comprehension. If you're not in Bible studies, not understanding exactly who God is and what are his precepts, then you don't understand what God's doing when he's doing the things that he does to you. He has a plan for your life, but you don't always want to listen to it. And fairness says young people are passionate about things being fair. And as we look around, this is not the case. Does the world seem fair to you? No, it's what we say. The world's not fair. It treats others differently than it treats you or me sometimes. The world just isn't fair. That's because we do not understand the character of God on it. And the number four, it says, the reason why we have such a problem at times is real simple. We desire to sin. How many times have you heard people say, the Bible applies to you, but it doesn't apply to me in that certain situation? I'm different. Now, God's principles are the same regardless, isn't it? It was the same yesterday, it would be the same today, it would be the same tomorrow. So this is what Proverbs tells us. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And what does it say? And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. It says, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. See, when we pray to God and we ask him for something, we don't need to doubt, is he going to answer it or not? He will always answer one of the three answers he's going to give us. But we just need to trust him to know that that's going to be what happens. Have you ever asked for salvation for somebody and it seems like you pray and pray and pray and it takes forever? And maybe 20 years later, all of a sudden, they come to know the Lord? Or maybe they'll never come to Lord, know the Lord. We just do not know God's answer on those situations. But we trust that he's going to answer it in one way or the other. Just like today, we trust that the Lord is in control of what's in our, going on in our lives and that we can depend on him. And it's through maturity and growing that we draw closer to God. That's why the young people struggle so much today, because they don't take the time to learn who God is. And if you don't know who God is, you'll never understand him. That's great. That's great. when we do learn who God is. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you're the God of the universe. You're the God we can bring questions to, our concerns to, and, and every doubt we have, we can bring to you, Lord. Sometimes we forget that. There was a thing, article that wrote the fact that says, in the morning when you get up, you write down every doubt of the day. And then when you're done telling God every one of your doubts, you can walk away knowing that he's taking care of them. So we give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.
have heard the joyful sound Jesus saves, Jesus saves Spread the tidings all around Jesus saves, Jesus saves Bear the news to every land Climb the steeps and cross the waves Onward tis our Lord's command Jesus saves, Jesus saves Wafted on the rolling tide Jesus saves, Jesus saves Tell to sinners far and wide Jesus saves, Jesus saves Sing ye islands of the sea Echo back ye ocean caves Earth shall keep her jubilee. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing above the battle strife. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. By his death and endless life. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing it softly through the gloom when the heart for mercy craves. Sing in triumph over the tomb. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Give the winds a mighty voice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, let the nations now rejoice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, shout salvation full and free. Highest hills and deepest caves, this our song of victory. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Amen. Father, thank you for your message to us. Thank you to your grace and mercy. Light that path in front of us, Lord, and give us strength to walk in faith and not doubting. It's in Jesus. Amen. Amen.